Welcome to Radically Loved Radio. I wanted to create a place where people can go to to get inspired, get motivated, or find some clarity and get tools to create a radically loved life. I will do my best to provide information on a variety of subjects, including yoga, holistic health, life coaching, spirituality, meditation, and overall mindful living. Each episode will bring you some of the world's best spiritual leaders, entrepreneurs, yoga teachers, coaches, along with some of my closest friends, and we will talk about their life experiences and journeys to create something more out of their lives and how they continue to grow to make that happen. Thanks for listening. Going on my very first yoga retreat seven years ago was a major turning point in my life, so much so that now I get to lead these amazing yoga adventures all over the world. These are truly transformative experiences, and I believe that anyone who enjoys a lifestyle of health and wellness can greatly benefit from a yoga retreat. So, this February, I'm taking a very special group with me on a yoga and meditation retreat to Thailand. The retreat is called Love, Gratitude, and Freedom. The retreat is about designing a roadmap to connect to love in your life. We will use different yoga modalities to connect with our sense of purpose, gratitude, and achieve more freedom in our lives. Everyone knows how during our daily lives we get totally bombarded and totally overwhelmed and it's really nice to be able to get away and go somewhere with like-minded individuals, eat really delicious food, and be able to just immerse ourselves in practice. You'll take your yoga to the next level, you'll get a new perspective, you'll be able to have a digital detox, you'll be able to relax and de-stress, and maybe learn something new. If you're interested, go to www.radicallyloved.com forward slash events, read all about the retreats there, or you can email me, rosie at radicallyloved.com for more information. David Vago is an associate psychologist in the Functional Neuroimaging Lab. He is also an instructor at Harvard Medical School. His big aim is to clarify adaptive mind-brain-body interactions and their therapeutic relevance in psychiatric settings. So basically, he's been specifically focusing on the study of mindfulness-based interventions in clinical settings and the basic cognitive neuroscientific mechanism by which mindfulness-based practices function. So in simple terms... He's studying how mindfulness is effective in neuroscience today, and I cannot wait to share this episode with you. I had my notepad out the entire time taking notes. I learned so, so much about all the benefits of meditation, which I already knew, but he just reaffirmed all the information and all the study that I've already done. I'm so excited. I can't wait for you to hear this episode, and I'd love, love, love to hear what you guys thought. So many people are looking to begin a meditation practice or they're inquiring about mindfulness or the effects of neuroscience and the mind and all these different types of things. And so I figured why not get an expert (laughs) on the show (laughs) to talk to us about it. So I'm, I'm really excited. So thank you again so much for doing this. Yeah, sure. I, um, you know, it's my pleasure. I, I think dialogue is really important, um, especially as uh, fields like integrative medicine um, and a focus on wellness and uh, human flourishing really becomes more mainstream. Um, and we lose those labels of things like complementary or alternative yeah. approaches. Um, yeah. And yeah. and I'll tell you straight, straight off the bat here that the, the main reason that you know, complementary and alternative were in place, um, you know, that referred to things like folk medicine um, or anything really that didn't fit sort of the Western medical model. Um, Typically, it was reserved for anything that didn't have any scientific evidence um, or didn't have enough scientific evidence to support it and Mm -hmm. would then be considered alternative to Western medicine with its scientific, uh, empirical back, backing. Mm-hmm. And so, but if you use that, that sort of framework, you actually end up with very little, um, medicine that you can refer to that is non-complementary or non-alternative. Right. There's, there's, there's data that will always be on both sides of the fence. Um, for example, I'll just use the best examples, antidepressants, mm-hmm. uh, 
you know, there's evidence that we don't even, well, first of all, we don't even really know the mechanism by which uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors work. Mm -hmm. we, we've always thought, we've always sort of, you know, the science has always sort of led, put the, put the cart ahead of the horse by saying, okay, we have some evidence suggesting that when your serotonin levels are depleted, you feel sad. Uh, and when we increase those levels, you feel happy. But um, as we get closer and closer with our, you know, finer grain sort of analyses, we realize that it's not so simple, uh, and the data is not so cut and dry, and that the placebo effect is actually a third of the effect of antidepressants. Oh wow! So, I I would say that you know everything that we do in healing traditional uh, approaches um, that come from. Um, traditions that are much older than, you know, America is, um, should also be considered as uh, a form of medicine as long as it has some evidence behind it. It doesn't have to be overwhelming, um, but, you know, the fact that people are reporting that they feel better or that there are physical symptom changes uh, due to that type of medicine, then it should be considered all just good medicine. So we should just drop the labels and uh, talk about it as integrative, which is, I think, you know, where the field is sort of moving now. You know, mainstream medicine is integrative medicine. Yeah, which I think is something so incredible that's happening now because for the longest time it, it felt that it was completely divided. It was either one or the other. Yeah, and, there, and you know, it's sort of, I think, you know, a lot of, uh, physicians and scientists um, sort of look down upon uh, um, other approaches that were considered complementary alternatives, such as acupuncture, massage, tai chi, and also meditation and yoga. Um, you know, natural products such as herbs and botanicals and vitamins, those dietary supplements. You know, people spend, I think Americans spend like $30 billion out of pocket on these approaches. And they feel that it helps them. Mm -hmm. um, so we just don't, there's not a lot of research on, on a lot of these approaches, um, but it's growing. And it's, that research is necessary to provide that sort of evidence base to support um, how to use it appropriately and, you know, facilitate it, how it's going to be integrated into mainstream healthcare. So th that's kind of, Part of the mission of integrative medicine in general is to provide more of an evidence base for traditional healing practices that are now being used more often, and people are reporting uh, that it makes them feel better. So one of my jobs as a scientist um, is, at least a neuroscientist, is to understand the mechanisms by which these practices work um, after at least there's been some initial evidence to show that people feel better when they do with them, mm -hmm. like yoga or meditation or acupuncture. So we just need to understand, uh, number one, that these are these techniques, these, these approaches um, can be considered mainstream. And number two, if they're helping people be, um, because they're feeling better when they do them, then how are they working? And yeah. just like any other treatment, it's all part of medicine. How did you begin to study neuroscience? What led you to this field? Yeah, I always, uh, I, I love this question because it sort of, there's this Joseph Campbell sort of phrase that, or meme that sticks with me all the time. <laughs> and he says, follow your bliss. Uh-huh. Um, there's the, um, uh, what was the, 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 series that did, um, I think it's called the, um, oh, the Power of Myth. Oh, yes. I think when I was uh, in undergrad, um, I was reading that book, The Power of Myth, and there's a whole series of videos on, about it, um, looking at myths and sort of the hero's journey yeah. and all these sort of archetypal sort of themes and motifs that are, that continually repeat themselves in, in our in our everyday societies and contemporary and historical. Um, everything back to hum like our early hominid ancestors are going through similar sort of patterns of 
of, uh, of, of just this, um, these motifs that sort of repeat themselves mm-hmm. related to just, you know, humanity. Um, anyway, so that, that, that inspired me to think about um, mind um, and brain and, and body and how it all interacts. Uh, and I've always been sort of interested in the mind and brain since I was young. Um, you know, I took a few classes, I think even in high school, that, that you know, I really found um, a passion for, I would say. And just a, a, curious, a curiosity, sense of curiosity, how things work. Um, that, that's really the, the driving force. But really, what we're talking about here is, you know, your path, your calling, right? We all we all find sort of a a sense of purpose and meaning in life by things that make us most happy um, if we can do them, you know, throughout our every day. And I think. You know, I think of that that path that of the bliss following where your sort of calling may take you as um, sort of a big boat that's going down an o- in, and flowing down a really large river. Say, yeah. yeah, you're not really in control of that boat. You're just sort of steering along the way. Um, sometimes you hang out in an eddy for a while, and sometimes you continue down the stream, and everything's new and. and you're really just heading in one sort of path, but um, a lot of the choices that sort of arise are beyond your control. Uh, and so I could say a lot of things that happened in, in, in my past have been sort of uh, circumstance and chance. Mm-hmm. Um, I've certainly um, feel fortunate to have given a, been be given a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, but I, of course, it comes with failure too. We all fail at many things in our lives, whether they're small failures, um, like a grant that you that you don't get, right, or a job that you don't get, or an internship, or a travel experience. Those are all sort of considered failures, but they're all sort of learning experiences along the way. And and really, it led me to a religion class, a specific one in my undergrad called. Um, the Asian Search for Self, and this was a book, uh, a, a class by Douglas Brooks, who is uh, a uh, Hindu uh, scholar, um, and he was incredibly inspiring to me. Um, and the class really got me to think about me- meditating formally. Wow. So I went to, I found a vipassana um, uh, meditation. Um, course that was offered in the Goenka style, <laughs> and that was 1996. And I, so I went and did a 10 day silent retreat. Yeah. Uh, you know where you basically uh, no phones, no notebook. You're not allowed to write anything down. There's no talking. Men and women are separated. Yeah. It's it was like a hardcore uh, sort of in depth. Uh, experience for for me, you know, in my 20s to sort of experience my mind in that way and really get to be become more familiar with it. And so this idea of bhavana, right? Is yeah, bhavana, exactly. Yes. It's a familiarity to cultivate. It's, just, it's, a, it's the word for meditation, um, really what it refers to. And the Tibetan is gom. And really what it refers to is cultivating, cultivating familiarity with your own mind. And when you do this sort of meditative practice, you become more intimate with your mental habits and patterns. And that that blew me away in 96. And I really haven't looked back since. I continued to practice. I was in a cognitive neuroscience undergraduate program that led to uh, a graduate program in cognitive neuroscience at the University of Utah. Uh, I did basic neuroscience. And at that time, nobody was really studying meditation. Yeah, there was a, a number of research studies that were that came out in the 70s on transcendental meditation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it sort of petered out, and there, it wasn't given a lot of credibility to study that kind of uh, state of consciousness until Ricky Davidson uh, started doing that, and Francisco Varela, another cognitive neuroscientist, started studying uh, 
meditative states um, with a real rigorous neuroscientific lens. And once they did that and published a few articles, for example, in 2004, we have the first uh, major peer-reviewed uh, scientific journal, Trends in Cognitive, Trends of Cognitive uh, uh, Sciences, mm -hmm. uh, with a picture of the Buddha on the cover. And so that was a first. Um, and that was a, a paper that came out of Richie Davidson's lab showing that uh, advanced meditation practitioners who, who generate a non-referential state of compassion, which I can explain later what that is, mm -hmm. uh, they showed dramatic changes in their EEG signature that no one's ever seen before. This gamma band activity, so greater than 60 hertz, which is really fast, activity and very high in amplitude, so really strong signal synchronized uh, in, in especially over frontal and parietal areas that are important for attention. And that was immediately generated when they started the practice. Uh, it was present at a smaller amplitude before they started the practice um, in comparison to controls. And it lasted longer after they finished their practice. So there was a clear indication that doing this practice did something in the brain that no one's ever seen before, suggesting that mental training, like meditation, can have profound effects on uh, brain functioning. And since 2004, so the last decade, we've seen an explosion of research looking specifically at that, looking at how the brain changes in response to meditative practice. Mm -hmm. I've just been on that boat sailing down the river, uh, you know, being sort of, um, I think, surrounded by many great researchers um, doing this kind of work who had some mentorship with Richie, um, who been sort of uh, associated with the Mind and Life Institute yeah. and, the Dalai, and the Dalai Lama, of course, mm -hmm. um, because of a lot of this is due to his uh, intention, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact that Western scientists and Buddhist scholars are, are having dialogue about the benefits of meditation and how it may change the brain. And, you know, I've just been on that same road. Uh, in 2000, uh, uh, I think it was 11, I had the opportunity to go present my, my research to the Dalai Lama uh, personally at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and there were six of us that represented the younger generation um, of scientists. And he looked at each one of us and pointed his finger at each of us and said, you, will, you are all responsible for reducing suffering in this world. <laughs> and, you know, when he points his finger at you, you're sort of like, uh, okay. And he said, I'll be watching you. Uh, even when I die, I come back as, a, as if I go to heaven or if I go to hell. I'll come back either as angel or a devil, and I'll be, you know, he's kidding around, but <laughs> I will come back and be watching you. And uh, so I took that to heart, actually, yeah. and um, I felt, okay, this is my final sort of, you know, motivation that I need to say that this path, this bliss that I've been following is is true, and this is a calling for me. I really feel like I really didn't, create the causal chain of events for these things to happen, but um, I, I do my best to uh, not just practice the Dharma, so to speak, from my own personal sense, but to study it, uh, yeah. using my skills as a neuroscientist uh, to understand how it works. And in the end, the idea is that you're helping reduce suffering in the world. So, that's my primary motivation, is to use the skills that I have and to give back what I can as a form of service. Um, so teaching, you know, having these sort of dialogues, mm -hmm. uh, and doing the science to show that this is mainstream medicine. This is really about how to use your mind to uh, uh, not only improve our health and well-being, but to experience what it is to be like a flourishing human being. Yeah. So not just fixing what's broken, but actually helping provide us with this, the skills and the tools to provide us, to give us the resilience factors, the resilience factors to help us 
you know, adapt to the everyday stresses in life um, with a little grace uh, and not end up, you know, becoming entirely uh, emotionally dysregulated. Yeah, exactly. Every time somebody cuts us off in traffic or, or <laughs> says something mean. To explain it to our listeners, what is mindfulness? Ah, well, I'll tell you, there is no single authoritative definition of what mindfulness is, whether you're a Buddhist scholar, uh, or so across schools of Buddhism, there's no agreement, uh, and um, even in the, the scientific arena, there's no real agreement. Uh, so John Kabat-Zinn, when he created his Mindfulness-Based Trust Reduction course, uh, in uh, late 70s and early 80s, uh, he used this definition of, of mindfulness as a state of paying attention mm-hmm. uh, in a particular way uh, in the present moment uh, that's non judgmental. Uh, and sometimes he says with an with a element of curiosity. And so that definition has been helpful, but it's a very contemporary sort of interpretation of what mindfulness is. Uh, mindfulness comes from the Pali root sati. Uh, sati uh, actually refers to, um, uh, is, is, is defined literally as memory, um, and it comes from the, there's a, a root to that, um, which is sarati, which is the act of remembering, like I said, the Pali root sati mm-hmm. also comes from the Sanskrit smirti, and the, the 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 Sanskrit actually refers to an object of that which is remembered. So mindfulness is really uh, that object of w- what is remembered continuously uh, through every moment of uh, of your day. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea there being that you're always remembering, say, the precepts. Um, the ethical precepts, you know, how to behave, how to, how, you know, um, uh, how, how to think, and things like this. But it also refers to uh, a particular state of, of awareness. So, um, sometimes referred to as um, bare attention. Uh, in the heart of Buddhist meditation, which is a, a Buddhist text that's very common, or even in the Visuddhimagga, which is... Uh, like basically a text of what what is defined as the path of purification, mm-hmm. uh, and then also the Satipatthana Sutta, which is the original sutta that was that was given by, well, supposedly given by the Buddha, the mm-hmm. historical Buddha himself, which is setting up or the foundation of mindfulness. Satipatthana, patana meaning presence of or foundation of. Uh, sutta. So setting up or the foundation of, of sati came with his original uh, instructions on how to reduce suffering. And the idea there is that um, through particular meditation practices, um, you can uh, have a direct path for the cessation of suffering, otherwise known as awakening or realization. And it gets confusing, but what, is, what do they mean by awakening? What, yeah. what, 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 is, this, what is this realization? Right. Of? Right. What is this right. insight that he's talking about? And can we? And then you have to start talking about what enlightenment is, because mm-hmm. it's part of the it's part of the goal state for setting up mindfulness to uh, be aware of what the factors are that relate to enlightenment. I think from a Western sort of epistemology or uh, science of mind, we can just say mindfulness can be referred to in various contexts as a state of awareness uh, and discernment, state of awareness and discernment, uh, as a trait, sort of an enduring cognitive and emotional disposition. Uh, So you can be a mindful person and there are certain characteristics that allow you to... uh, uh, pay attention in this particular way without a lot of judgment, non-reactivity, uh, and stability of attention. Uh, and so we can take those characteristics and say, well, that person is a little bit more mindful than that person. 
And we can say, if they meditate, do they gain more of those characteristics or not? And that, that's a trait. So we said there's a state of awareness, a trait, which is sort of a disposition uh, that involves uh, sort of personality characteristics. There's a process of mindfulness. So doing uh, mindfulness or mindfulness exercises uh, could, could really involve a whole uh, system of what we refer to as uh, changes in self-awareness, self-regulation, and self-transcendence, uh, or uh, otherwise known as sort of increasing empathic concerns for others in a very analytical way, uh, transcending, transcending self-focused needs and being more pro-social. And all those elements are sort of the path of mindfulness, the mm -hmm. process. And those are really described in sort of the, the Satipatthana, Sutta, it's really how to achieve the direct path for cessation of suffering and awakening. Mm -hmm. That's a process, so a state, a trait, a process. Some people even refer to mindfulness as a form of meditation. I practice mindfulness meditation. So that particular style of meditation is usually uh, a uh, open monitoring style of practice where you're just aware of anything that arises, any object that arises, uh, and you are, it's basically letting your mind wander with awareness. You're aware of whatever arises without judgment, without reactivity, without intentionally moving your, your attention to any particular uh, thought or emotion or feeling. So those are the, the, the four different ways we can sort of contextualize it, as a state, a trait, a process, or a form of meditation. Wow. I mean, that's, and, and it begins to get so complex. Uh, some people think that in order to practice mindfulness, you need to be a Buddhist. Is this true or no? Oh, absolutely not. No. So, I mean, when we're, it depends how you contextualize it, right? Mm -hmm. So, again, the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, so this is the foundation or the presence of setting up the foundation of mindfulness, uh, it was intended, the Anapanasati was the first practice that was described. And really what that describes, so Sati is the mindfulness, Anapana is following the breath. So using mindfulness of the breath or awareness of the breath was the, was the, the foundational practice to set up a state of mindfulness. Uh, uh, and no, the Buddhists don't own awareness. <laughs> they, the Buddhists don't own compassion. Uh, they don't really own any of these these forms of mental training. Really, they just uh, they articulated a very clear path towards stabilizing the mind uh, as a as a sort of in a, in, a, in a sort of an attentional way or cognitive way. And uh, articulated in a way that was selfless, mm -hmm. that not only you, you don't identify with a permanent, unchanging self, but that it is geared towards the practice, is geared towards uh, uh, others, mm -hmm. altruistic, in an altruistically motivated way. So um, a colleague of mine recently uh, and I were talking about how to frame the types of meditation practices. And one, one way you could think about it is three different forms of meditation that, that come from the mindfulness sort of tradition, mm -hmm. or really Buddhist tradition, uh, across schools of Buddhism. You have uh, attentional uh, forms of meditation or concentrative styles of meditation, which focus on an object or a series of objects or any object that arises. Then you have your, what's called, uh, constructive types of practices, which are really about generating uh, altruistically motivated, or motivations for doing the practice. So not just for yourself, so not just about reducing your stress and increasing your performance, say, at work, but to helping improve the, the, the conditions, the human condition mm -hmm. uh, around you yeah. 
uh, yeah. in relation to yourself and to the world at large. Yeah, like loving kindness meditation. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Loving kindness would fit into these constructive practices. Then you would have deconstructive practices, which really uh, are more analytical in nature. Um, and those are practices actually that are, are practiced even more uh, commonly than you would imagine. Uh, for example, the Dalai Lama's own tradition or school of Buddhism is the Golupa tradition, and they practice analytical forms of meditation more than they do uh, formal uh, sitting meditation. What kind of what kind of meditation is that? Can you break it down for us? Yeah, so they focus on uh, a lot of cerebral type of thinking practices, <laughs> where, uh, for example. Well, the first one that's most common is debate. So having dialogue uh, and and having a constructive sort of a way of interacting, a relational way of interacting with others, is a, is a foundational practice in this analytical style, where you're debating people on a particular topic, and you go back and forth in a very lively way, uh, just proving. Uh, Proving uh, your position on a point. So it not only does it help you formulate your own ideas in your own mind, but it helps you communicate more effectively with others and connect with others. Mm-hmm. Often meditation is thought of as a very soul practice, like an individual practice that you can go sit in a room you know, on a cushion by yourself and do it, which you can. But we have to remember that in this context of mindfulness, the, the, the greater umbrella of mindfulness, we consider all of these practices, uh, that the, the goal is, is not to just sit in a room on a cushion with your eyes closed. The goal is to connect, to make that human connection with others. That's the goal. Yeah. People don't realize often that that's the goal. Yeah, there's side effects of decreased stress and improved attention, but the main goal here is to actually connect with other human beings. Wow. And so if we think about that, that's quite powerful. And um, so that those are foundational in the, uh, the constructive practices, you know, doing things like uh, metta, loving kindness. But in the more analytical, deconstructive practices, you are learning to uh, uh, do these debate practices that allow you to connect with others, formulate sort of ideas, uh, and... Uh, also, think of concepts such as emptiness and the meaning of that, or selflessness, or uh, the eternal self, and what that means. And that's where Zen practice uh, focuses a lot of time on these koans of these sort of nonsensical types of concepts or or um, sort of riddles, where your mind logically is not making sense of it. Mm -hmm. But the fact is you get lost in the semantics so much that you're, you're something, some sort of sudden realization may manifest that it's all just language and semantics and words and that there is no self, for example. And that realization is uh, generated through these analytical practices. Wow, and so, and can be extremely intense for for people. Oh, that kind of realization, absolutely. <laughs> the the realization that there is no self it can be very scary, yeah. and yeah. and in fact, these are issues that are now being confronted in contemporary mindfulness movement. Is that okay? So, say you do an eight week mindfulness based uh, stress reduction course. And you got what you needed, a little stress reduction, your intention is better. Maybe you did a little headspace on your on your iPhone for, you know, eight weeks. Uh, you got your five minutes in here, five minutes in there. Great. That's all great. But is that, uh, is that the end? Where are you going with that? Is, is that going to be sufficient for you to be a flourishing human being? Uh, are you going to be... Um, happy uh, in a eudaimonic kind of sense of happiness, not in a hedonic sense where, Mm. you know, many of these practices are also helpful in reducing our attachments to the materialistic 
the sort of world we live in, right? So yeah. we're often we're often striving so much to get to have recognition, to have status, to have the new car, the big house, you know, and my, my, mine, I want it, failing to realize that our own happiness and well-being, the, the, the sense of, of purpose and meaning and autonomy in our lives that really generate true happiness comes from our altruistic motives. So when we give ourselves back to people, that's where we actually see our happiness improving. Uh, and that's empirical research mm-hmm. right there, showing that you, you don't become happier when you make more money. Uh, you know, those are all little bumps in the sort of the, your global level of happiness. You know, you know, a little bit of, it goes up a little bit, but it always comes back down to a baseline. And even if you have tragedy, like someone dying in your life who's close to you or losing a, an appendage even, uh, those types of things will certainly get you down. But you come back up eventually to your baseline. And, and often many people who are in undeveloped, uh, you know, low SES uh, settings have seem to be more happy and satisfied with their life than people who are living in fancy houses with... Uh, big cars and you know don't know what to spend their money on yeah yeah i mean this is this is such a great segue to get your take on our current climate and and i i sent this to you or i wanted to talk to you about the the feeling of our collective state just even as a western society there's been so many studies that have proven that Western society as we know it is it, in general is not happy, right? It's, it's a stressed and anxiety ridden, uh, state, right? There's people that are totally overworked or completely stressed out. Um, and there's just so much more focus going on this consumer driven wanting more things or taking unnecessary uh, placebo medicines to <laughs> to, yeah. to create more happiness or or a sense of wholeness. So I'm curious to to hear what you think about that, and if you agree that we are currently in in a in a state of unhappiness or unease. Yeah, especially now you know, with the sort of political climate mm-hmm. um, and what's happening around the world. I mean, things, when you turn on the television and see something like Syria um, and what's ha- what happened in Aleppo, oh, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it's so salient. And, you know, how can we, we either avoid it as a way of regulating or we, you know, embrace it and we're distraught because we have no control over it. Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, often hear, well, what can I do? You know, I'm sitting here, you know, so far away from there. There's nothing I can really do. And and so, and plus we have our own stresses in our lives. And a lot of times we say, I just saw an article about, about time management. And we often say, oh, I don't have time to meditate. I, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't have time to do yoga. Mm-hmm. I don't have time to do these things about well-being. I've got other things to do. Uh and the the article I was reading, I think it was even from the New York Times, uh, it was talking about how instead of using time, replace that word with priorities, that I don't, I can't prioritize ah. this right now, or I can't prioritize that. Yeah. And it makes, it makes, it's the same sort of idea that I, I'm not prioritizing meditation right now, mm-hmm. or I don't have the time to meditate right now, but it sounds very different. And the question is, what are you going to do with every moment of your life? Because that's the 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 secret uh, that I've found uh, in just doing this type of research is that every moment counts. That every moment, how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we perceive the world, the seeing, the perceiving is key. And I, I, this is the the model that I always work from. Is that I work from a a, 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 a model of self processing, which 
can be thought of as a string of moments. And, for example, I'm 41 years old. That's about 42,000 moments of 500 millisecond time chunks. And if we think of each moment as a 500 millisecond <laughs> chunk of time, which we can, empirically we have evidence for this, uh, we can say that each moment, it actually influences how, who you are right now. Mm-hmm. So you have a choice uh, to prioritize certain things in your life. Uh, and certainly we have important things that we have to do, like put food on the table, uh, pay attention to our families uh, and our bosses, uh, you know, and all these types of things that are our regular routine. But really in, in those moments that fill up our daily lives, we, we have certain mental habits and each moment really is made up of habits of perception and interpretation. So there's a, a level of perception that's happening even at the level of non-conscious processing. So l- let's break down or unpack what this moment looks like because maybe for your listeners it could be helpful. Uh, if we think of a moment as this 500 millisecond chunk of time, the first 250 milliseconds, in that moment is actually non-conscious processing by your brain and body. Your brain is constantly picking up what is salient, what is uh, relevant, and orienting your body in preparation to do something with that information that, that, that through time has been determined to be relevant for you. Now, there's a lot of other information happening right now, like uh, uh, there's a fan behind me uh, coming from the, the vent. Uh, there's uh, a plant in front of me. There's some rocks and some pens, but I'm not paying attention to them. I'm choosing to to speak to you to a phone. Actually, I'm looking at a phone <laughs> and speaking to the speaker. Uh, you know, we're not paying attention to the, the feeling of the seat upon us. So we make these choices at some level, many of the things that are happening at non-conscious levels to sort of have a coherent sort of picture of the world and to, to have a coherent discussion in this, in, this, in this case. And so if we think about that, then only half of each moment is conscious. And so that, that's an important realization. Uh, and with that other half, so at 250 milliseconds, we finally gain conscious awareness of what we're looking at, what we're doing, what we're saying, what we're feeling, and we have a chance to either evaluate or interpret it uh, uh, in a positive way or adaptive way or as an, in a negative way. And what happens pre-conscious, we don't have control over, but the conscious part, the nice part about this model is that the conscious part is always influencing the non-conscious part, mm. reinforcing the, 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 the neural connections that are, are, are um, uh, uh, driving the non-conscious pattern. So if you think about stress, since we all can, can uh, uh, agree that our lives are full of stress, uh, and stressors in our lives. Yes. Uh, uh, we can look at the stressors in our life at, at with anger, anxiety, fear, sadness. Uh, those types of habits certainly are influencing yourself and how you construct yourself and your mental habits. And all that non-conscious processing will then be uh, set up to respond in a way that's, that's uh, automatic as anger, anxiety, fear, and sadness. So it's this uh, reinforcement that's continually feedbacking, for, uh, feedbacking upon yourself and your own construction of self. It's reinforcing each other. It becomes crystallized and reified as the cognitive structure and your schema of who, you're, who you are. I'm an angry sad, 
anxious, fearful person. Um, That's just how I respond. When somebody does something that is interpreted as a stressor, we say we're stressed out because it becomes our pattern of anger, fear, anxiety, and depression. But if we have, if we take control over that conscious part of that moment and say, breathe, let's just focus on breath for a moment. And when we do that, we're, in, we're actually engaging our parasympathetic tone, the relaxation response, and it is counteracting the natural tendency or automatic tendency for anger, anxiety, fear, or sadness. So we can, every moment, then, have an opportunity to move into a more adaptive uh, neuroplastic trajectory uh, for flourishing. Mm -hmm. That's the key, to to really perceive or really evaluate the world uh, in a more adaptive way. Uh, And that's really where mindfulness is helpful, because with mindfulness, you're not doing anything except for paying attention. You're Mm -hmm. aware. And so whether you're, you know, in uh, traffic or whether you're sitting on a cushion and having negative thoughts, each one of those contexts is an opportunity for you to just be aware of those negative or maladaptive habits. And through just awareness, the negative habits of that's happening in that non-conscious time chunk is going to uh, shift yeah. or something adaptive. Yeah, tell us about the role of compassion in this framework. Well, compassion, well... um, (laughs) You said you were going to talk about compassion earlier, so I want to bring it back. It was a teaser. Right. Yeah, so (laughs) it's also uh, complicated to think about this word compassion because it's it's often conflated with um, a lot of other concepts like empathy, Mm -hmm. um, um... Emotional contagion um, and sympathy, for example, right? Um, And so let me just say that compassion from the Buddhist perspective is non-referential. And this is the practice that I referred to that was first published in 2004 by Richie Davidson, coming back full circle here. Um that practice that was done by these advanced monks that showed the increased gamma band activity dramatically really refers to the generation of the the altruistically motivated wish for the reduction of suffering universally across all all sentient beings, self and others. And that generation that comes, you know, from a heart centered sort of experience. And when I say heart-centered, it really does feel like it's coming from the body. Uh, it's an embodied type of feeling state. That It's also considered a non-dual state, meaning that there is no distinction between subject and object. And that's a very advanced state of meditation. So we can't expect everyone to be able to generate that level of, of um, awareness attention, uh, and universal non-referential compassion. That is a very highly specified practice in Buddhism. Now, love and kindness is something a little different. Uh, And typically when we talk about compassion in a colloquial sense, we're often thinking about it as a mix between sympathy empathy, and loving kindness for others. And so we could, it's more easy to talk about compassion in those terms than use the word compassion because it gets too confusing. It's like the word consciousness. Mm-hmm. There's so many ways that it's used. Uh, it's hard to uh, just use it and expect everyone to understand. But if we say, if we unpack it and just say, okay, well, some people refer to this concept of self-compassion. From the Buddhist perspective, the way I just referred to it, there's no such thing as self-compassion because compassion refers to the, the desire for the freedom of suffering of all sentient beings, including yourself. 
So there's no distinction between self and other. So how can there, there be self-compassion? Right. Right? Now, there have been scales that have been created and workshops for generating self-compassion uh, by Chris Germer and Kristen Neff, for example. And that's fine because in our society, we certainly have a tendency to uh, be very hard on ourselves. Um, and having to focusing on generating love and kindness for ourselves, I think is really important. Uh, and I think they would too. That's exactly what their point is, that starting uh, a meditation practice, we should start by making sure that you know, we're being kind and considerate to ourselves before we can help others. Just like when we're in an airplane and they say, when the oxygen masks come down, be sure to put it on your own face before you help your children. Right. So, um, uh, empathy really um, refers to um, a, a state in which you can put your you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, so to speak. It's it's really a cognitive state where you're able to almost understand what other people are thinking or feeling. And it's really just a state of of understanding. It's otherwise referred to as a theory of mind. You have you have a theory about what somebody else is feeling or thinking. And that's that's empathy, and it it it's important for the generation of compassion, but it is often conflated or mixed up. It's not the same. Mm. And sympathy uh, is is more of a, um, a an emotional state where you are feeling. Um, uh, you're generating uh, some level of uh, discomfort towards um, somebody who may be suffering. Um, but you know, symp- let's not forget, sympathy you know, is, is often a little bit removed. It doesn't often require much investment emotionally from an individual. You know, feelings of pity and sorrow for someone else's misfortune isn't necessarily going to fill you with any sort of feelings of of that suffering whereas uh empathy could actually you can actually mimic that state of suffering if yeah. you if you're able to um which is a little bit more powerful um and then there's emotional contagion which is slightly different also it's like these are all like cousins in the same uh context of of social cognitive uh processing so uh, emotional contagion is when you have a feeling state and somebody else starts to feel the same thing just by being near you and something like, you know, you're laughing and then somebody else starts laughing. Right. Um, so that's... that's uh, so those are the, the sort of differences there. And I think... But you were asking really, how does compassion uh, fuel our habits? Um I really think of it as uh, generating these sort of... Um, the, so you can do it explicitly or implicitly. And um, when we refer to it as explicit, I think what we're, for, we're referring to is um, a, a loving-kindness type of practice. Uh, and... Um, so a loving-kindness type of practice explicitly allows you to generate a real powerful sense of love that's, that's unconditional uh, for, for yourself, for people around you, uh, and people who are, are distant related to you. And often you use um, somebody or, or some sort of pet or, or, or a child or a sibling who you have unconditional love for. And usually the, the metaphor that's used in Buddhism is the mother and the child because, of course, the mother has unconditional love for the child that's mm-hmm. undeniable, typically. And 
imagine taking that love that you have for your child and transferring the same love to the people who sit around you right now, to the people who are in the office next door, to the people who are driving down the road around you, to the people who are killing others, to the people who you do not like politically or otherwise. If, you, if we're able to at least attempt to generate that kind of feeling explicitly by doing these types of practices, well, that's how you can help the world, and that's how you can contribute to all the suffering that's happening in the world explicitly mm. by doing those types of practices. And that's going to change your own motivations uh, 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 of how you experience the world, how you in your relationship to others. So it's a really profound type of practice, explicitly. Wow. I, uh, I've, I've been doing nothing but taking notes this entire time you've been oh, talking. Right. Oh. It's, so, it's, so, it's so good. I want to respect your time, so I only have a couple more questions, but I'll, I'll okay. go ahead and, and you can finish your thought if you want. But um, I... In the, like just blown away by all the information and it's still like we're we're barely scratching the surface of yeah these yeah, topics definitely. right it's just not enough time we're just gonna have to do another one yeah and i i mean the the, the take-home point here is that every moment is an opportunity for you to better yourself and the people around you yeah your relation yeah. to the people around you it's really every moment because the perception is key because, like I said, if every moment is 500 milliseconds long and every moment is constantly uh, feed, is, is a form of what you're thinking, what you fill your mind with uh, is feeding back upon your own self structures in your brain of what defines you and what defines your mental patterns, your habits. Uh, that's an opportunity for you to fill your mind with positive, not po necessarily positive things, but you can fill it with explicitly positive or, or love and kindness and, and uh, empathic sort of concern for others. Or you can just be aware of your mental habits. And through just awareness, you will, uh, in a sense, end up being more altruistically motivated in your behavior. Oh, well, that, thank you for that. That's one of the big driving forces behind why I created this podcast and my brand or my business radically loved is this idea that there is a, a bigger force or a, a bigger sort of awareness or consciousness or, you know, God or whatever. There's just this bigger force in the world that's constantly sending us love and kindness. So we are all radically loved and that's sort of this idea. It's, it's love and kindness. You know, it's like, how do you walk love and kindness meditation? How do you live it on the cushion and off the cushion in, in your life? And so I'll ask you the final question before we, uh, we finish. And okay. the question is, how do you feel radically loved? And what do you radically love? Oh, uh, that's, Actually, I mean, that's easy for me because I have kids. I have two kids. And, um, you know, and, and it goes back to that same metaphor, you know, of the unconditional love. Uh, I used to, before kids, I had a dog that I just, I, I mean, followed me everywhere. And I loved that dog unconditionally. And I had long conversations, actually, with, with, with Rinpoche's uh, about dogs and whether, you know, what role they play in sort of a, you know reincarnation or you know are they some oh. yeah there's, there's something powerful about their companionship that they're, how they're so selfless they seem they seem to be right so yeah. they, they seem so they so, so committed to their owners and uh, I was like oh my dog is totally I has unconditional love for me I and the dog loves me so much I get to feel it and I have unconditional love for her and the the one Rinpoche that I was talking to, Geshe Dorji Damdul, actually, is a Geshe. And he said, uh, well, how do you know that if you start stop feeding the dog, that would you, that, that kind of condition of that you feed it, 
uh, and that love that it has for you might go away because you're no longer feeding it. And I said, well, I guess I don't know that for sure. I'd like to think that if I stopped feeding my dog, it would still love me. <laughs> but he was trying to make the point that, it, that, that there's, there's a possibility that it's conditioned uh. through, through uh, giving it food and attention and right. shelter. But that being said, uh, I, I feel radically loved and I feel radically, radical love towards my children and my dog, uh, the new dog. Uh, I'm not sure if my wife feels the same about the dog. Definitely. <laughs> um, but uh, when you when you just stare into the eyes of your child, you know, and especially when they're young enough and they're not like, well, Dad, what are you doing? Stop looking at me like that. <laughs> you know, they're young enough to just, just stare back. Um, you realize how much of this is unconditional, Mm. And and this is the type of practice that people like John McCransky, you know, I think if you if you're able to get John McCransky or Brooke Dodson Lavelle to, oh, to yeah. do, I think you'd really um your you and your listeners would really enjoy that because they focus a lot on these explicit practices where you're generating that unconditional love that you have for someone or something and transferring it to others that you don't have that state for. And, and pr- it's like a practice. The more you practice that feeling state, you're generating, it's influencing your cognitive structures and schemas and neural wiring responsible for that, those mental habits. So that's one explicit way which you can influence uh, generating this radical love and compassion state for for all of us, for everyone out there. Oh. A lot of it is still, it's still, we still have a hard time figuring out the best way to measure these things. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, a lot of these things I'm speaking from my heart, but I'm also, you know, trying to, to use my neuroscientific background mm-hmm. to, you know, to sort of provide a framework by which these practices actually do work. And how it really does change your brain, and and this is what you know we see in the in the literature that by if you fill your mind with negative states states like anger, fear, anxiety, or depression, you will feel angry, anxious, and depressed or fear. So if you fill it with uh, uh, feelings of compassion, and loving kindness, well, those are the types of things that you're going to start to experience too. Uh, around you. So it's really what you fill your mind with. Uh, and I think that's, that's a really critical point. Oh, that's and such a great, great point. Thank you so much. Where can our listeners go to find more information? I know that there's a couple of courses that you offer online and plus all the research that you've done. Where can we send our listeners to get more information about you? Uh, contemplativeneurosciences.com Okay, great. Are you on social media or any yeah, of those? Yeah, I'm all over the place. Yeah, you can find me on Facebook or Twitter. I think I'm Dave Vago on Twitter and uh, Instagram. I'm all over the place. You just have to Google me and you'll find me. We'll, uh, um, it, we'll attach all of your links uh, on our show notes so people will be able to just click on them. Okay, so in closing, I want to say that I appreciate you and all of your work so much, everything that you're doing for research and mindfulness and meditation and all of these integrative practices. I am so grateful for you and all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for being part of this community and for coming onto the show and for everything that you're doing. My pleasure, and to you too. Thanks for spreading the word and and, uh... Uh, especially the feeling states of radical love to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. For more information, visit www.radicallylove.com forward slash podcast to read all about today's guests or past guests. You can click on any of the links or for more information, you can always follow me on Instagram at Rosie Acosta or Twitter at Rosie Acosta and let us know what you thought.